I thought it'd be really good to talk about all the tips that we have learned to help you paint your army faster and better. There are three things that come down to why you should sub assembly. Things that I find are normally the first things that people cull in terms of speed are some of the most important things for making a model look really, really good. If stuff like that is painted really, really nicely, that adds tons of value to the model. My mind is blown. I've never even thought of that before. It's kind of like do the complete opposite of what everyone else tells you to do. Yeah, spend more time on those details because that will give the impression that you've spent loads of time on the model. Once you've nailed it, you, you, you'll, you'll master it and not want to paint any other way. What have you been doing on your Night Lord then? Quite a bit actually. I actually, I, the, I've been base cutting all the details. I'm trying to literally keep, eat, tick off each step on the on on the, the tick list in relevant order. If he's looking for like evidence that James doesn't get to paint much, since the last week's episode, he's done more base coating of and model. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's very strategic base coating. Well, that's more the, base because, coating than me. Because the cape uh, on my <laughs> built models, <laughs> the, the cape is covering quite a bit of the model, so it's it's all about angles. Just Sub assemblies, Joe. Is that what the what the sword you posted? Is that from the same model? Yes. I'm I didn't know if that was like a little doing palette cleanser. Demon sword. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know if that was a sub assembly or a palette cleanser. Yeah. No, I'm doing it. Uh, I'm doing because the sword covers like the mid drift of the model. Mm. So fortunately, so I pinned it, so I can literally just take this, the sword out of the hand and paint the blade for both sides separately. So so yeah, nice. Got a methodology for that, or are you just uh, you're just throwing paint in it? Um, well, I'm doing a normal, it's, it's going to be a demon sword as I mentioned. So I'm, I'm, I'm not actually going to blend it. I'm going to blend it smooth, but I'm not going to blend it as smooth as I normally would because I want it to look like it's shimmering because I'm going to paint loads of faces onto the blade. And I don't, because the, the blend and the actual blade finish is not going to be the thing that, well, you look at it, but it won't be the thing that draws the eye. It'll be all the faces and demons on, on the actual blade, which will be the main points of interest. So I want it smooth enough that it still looks good as a blade, but at the same time, it needs to just, it's a backdrop to the actual detail and I want it looking like it's I said like it's shimmering and got some crazy warm energy on it so yeah so it's been quite fun yeah I've been doing a little bit of hobby uh, so competition season will soon be creeping up and like James I also don't get much time to paint so I'm the sort of person who has to plan like six months ahead yeah uh, every time I'm doing hobby now I've got like this inner monologue of like my own voice on the podcast and used to and I like can't get away with any shortcuts anymore because I'm yeah. like thinking about what model I'm going to do for like maybe like Golden Demon or something and I'm like I'll do something you know play to my strengths and then I'm hearing James be like no you should do something <laughs> different that you normally do step out of your comfort zone is it like that that bit in Star Wars where everyone's like use the force Luke but instead it's use the brush George <laughs> <laughs> yeah something like that uh, no for the first time to competition level uh, I'm doing an AOS model wow Ooh. yeah different are, we, so, are you revealing any more yeah so it is or? I'm doing the uh, Night Relic the Stormcast model cool which, is that there with a torch? Yeah, in fairness, it's not a torch. It's holding like a that sand timer thing, like a thing, a rune thing. It's holding a thing. At, at least, at least my, at least my answer is a bit more descriptive than the thing. Yeah, <laughs> he's got like a, a mace, and he's holding like a. Oh, a I know thing. the one you mean. Yeah, I know. I yeah. picked that. He's painting it for a competition piece. Uh, doesn't, doesn't know, know what doesn't it is. Doesn't know the thing that he's holding. <laughs> I'll put it this way. I went on GW's website, scrolled around a bit, and I went, oh, that one looks nice. And then I ordered it. But that is the right way to do it, because you just get a model that you really like the look of. I think that's so, the only way to do it. If it's like a range that you're not like super familiar with, I just, and I know I'm going to be spending like a couple hundred hours on it, then I might as well pick something that just jumps out to me on the page. It was such a, I was worried that I was going to be like finding something for the sake of finding something, but luckily it did just like jump out at me like on the page, like scrolling through the web page. I was like, oh, that, that's it. But um, I think that's in part probably because it's kind of Space Marine-esque, like Stormcast anyway kind of is, but it's got this like... um cloth like cape lower half section and from, it's kind of giving like space marine chaplain in a way yeah from know? from memory it is a, it's it's a bit of a bulkier stormcast isn't it yeah that model so it's it feels a bit more like a space marine or yeah very much like a chaplain or something like that um yeah oh, look, there's the thing it's holding yeah the thing um, sand timer isn't it no it's not you're thinking of a different model i think actually because like that Ah, uh, yes, I'm thinking. You're thinking of the model I was yeah, thinking of. Yeah. But even so, yeah, that one is particularly Space Marine-y, I yeah. would say. It's very Space Marine-y. Mace yeah. is cool. Cool model. I yeah. think I'm going to do the... Uh, are you going box art kind of colour scheme or are you going... Yeah, yeah, I'm going to do the gold. I think I'm going to try the NMM 
on the cloth as well, which is a bit of a touchy subject for me. <laughs> yeah, controversial. But, um, I figured because it's cloth, that's like... Flashback to George slating NMM within the first three episodes of this podcast. Well, we don't talk about that. But uh, <laughs> I think because it's normally... I've actually spoken before about how I don't like NMM and True Metallics together. together but I think in this context, because it's cloth, it just makes sense to me it's a different texture because they're not both supposed to be metal right so, ever yeah. since the episode where we where i said it was like the golden weave on fabric mm. it's the it's george's opinion on that as yeah i hadn't thought about it like that before you said that either to be fair I'm, so. I'm hopeful that i can paint it it looks really really good everyone will think it looks really really good and then i get to still say i hate it and then i'm not a hypocrite anymore <laughs> but no Got, do you know what be worse is if i actually painted down i really enjoy painting down, so your goal still is 180. I hope I spend 100 hours on this and I hate it at the end. Yeah, no, member specific. I can't like, I've, I've got to make my bed. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, true. You know. You've got to stick. That's the worst part of this podcast, by the way, for us. Well, it's been nailed to your opinions. Yeah, like... <laughs> They're like concreted forever. Yeah, yeah. you'll yeah. say something maybe just like... Not, not in passing. Like, I feel like the things we say we have actually thought about or something like that. But, like... You have to be more accountable than ever if your opinions change on something. Well, we done the episode and it was like hot takes. And I was like, like you can't yeah. do a black bass rim now. No. Because you'll be ridiculed. Yeah. I, I have to do a black bass well, rim or I'll be ridiculed. I'll have James going from my Instagram and telling me about all the stats <laughs> of how many black bass rims I've done over yeah. here. I'll get the so clues like, get the clue so out. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 things like that. Like I can't post a whip that's in the sub assembly, just in case. Yeah. I'm going to say so. One of you will see it. I'm going to say so. It's so controversial now. <laughs> I was looking through a very old codex the other day of one of my favourite guard regiments. I've got to be honest; they look better with a steel legion drab base room because they, <laughs> <are, laughs> they are steel legion. Oh, do you oh, know what's come full circle at last? Thank you so much. So that's I, the no, clip. No, I'm that's gonna, the I'm gonna, the I'm gonna the meet you. I'm gonna meet you in the middle and say, like I said last week, for certain basic um, schemes. Do you so know what's funny? We're on the same plane here because we actually had some models come in this week and I said, I think these would have looked better with a black base room and they had a still leash and drab one. So we've, you know so, what, James, we've yeah, uh, uh, I think the middle. Happy there. medium, yeah. There I refuse to be that adult about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's what I mean though. Like, I, can't, I feel like I can't now. I can't, do a normal I can't do I can't go against anything in like reality I just said that so that if I do paint a Steel Legion base room, you're covered I'm now. covered yeah, you're covered. It's, like, it's like you said we're immortalised yeah. from say on the show so James would be like well actually if you listen to episode <laughs> yeah, 28 yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> yeah yeah. so okay. basically we've just got to make sure we contradict ourselves at every every opportunity and yeah. that way we can still do whatever we want speaking of older episodes we've got like quite a few new listeners around here now mm. and I realise that a lot of people may not have listened to the older episodes and uh, something that I've noticed we've kind of accidentally done is we've just sort of assumed that everyone around here sort of knows who Siege is. Yeah. But I've, I've kind of got the vibe from some of the comments that people think that this is this it. Is it. This is the yeah. lot. But, uh, so all the models that you see on Instagram is us three. Just it's just playing. James sitting away. Yeah. I'm personally, I'm happy to take credit. For, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm happy that people out there, so there's some people out there will see like a platinum thing that Adam Skinner's done and they think there's a 33% chance that I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, do you want to just sort of cover the... Yeah, the sort of yeah. Layout? So, um, I don't know the best way to lay it out, really. We've got, I mean, we've got an entire episode about so each, the, yeah. the company and, and how it started and how we all both individually came into it. Um, but obviously, we're on the office side of things. Yeah, yeah. So... But we wanted to give credit to all the team uh, that aren't on camera that you don't see uh, because from the comments and things and from new listeners and people maybe that aren't so familiar with Siege, it potentially could come across like it's just us three and it, and it isn't. There's a lot more people involved than that. Um, obviously, George works in media. Um, so all the lovely photos uh, and things that you see, all the videos that we produce at the editing, uh, that's George's lovely handiwork. Um, Joe, who's been with the company four years, uh, it does all operations, so procedures, processes, does team management, does um, all the like, specifications and bits and bobs like that. Um, we also have Paul, who works in stores and packing. So if you're a client in the business and you receive anything from us, be it a project, a merchandise, uh, store orders, things like that, Paul would have worked on that. We've got Reem, other half, who works downstairs in the office as well. Um, and we've also got Kelly, who's joined us now in the office, a new team member who actually works in the office and helps with a lot of the day-to-day -day, uh, through sort of emails, client assistance, all those kind of things, team assistance. 
Um, and internally as well, Adam, one of the painters here, who uh, is a massive, massive Imperial Garden Ultramarines fan, um, has, has been with the business for, for just over four years, nearly five years as well. So it, in, he paints it, a lot of our preview stuff. So you'd see a lot of his work on um, on the Warhammer community yeah, articles and things. Yeah, so he's done some 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 amazing models over the years, including a uh, American Psycho uh, Night Lord. The American was, Psycho Night Lord was probably the most... Uh, prolific. The yeah. most known. There were yeah. memes of it I saw. They yeah. were just hilarious. But... Um, but yeah, so Ads Ad has been the, the 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 guy behind that as well, and then obviously to mention on top of that as well, we have our various different teams, and I can't can't do a conversation like we'll this. We'll be here for a while. If yeah, I'm not going li to list all of them, but obviously we've got various different teams. We've got Custom Service Warrior, and then obviously the Siege team. Um, who that's but, all the artists. Know, that, I mean, there's nearly eighty people. Yeah, if you're putting all those yeah. teams together, so yeah. a lot more than just us three knocking all. Yeah, those we've quickly gone from out. a thirty three percent chance to. Yeah, like, I mean, there's there's no there's zero percent <laughs> chance. There's zero percent chance I painted any of that platinum stuff. I'm afraid. Yeah, uh, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, being on media, I mean, I did used to paint for the company, and so did James. So you still do as well? Yeah, I still do occasionally. Technically, I suppose we both still do when we do the other things like for for preview stuff. Or, yeah, or, like we've done or, the Leviathan stuff. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. And whatnot. But uh, yeah, yeah, I just want to clear that up really because. I mean, I can't blame the listeners if you've uh, if you're new around here. Yeah, you either. Yeah, I mean, you don't, you're not going to know, are you, without without us saying? Yeah. Well, uh, speaking of new listeners, uh, if you are new around here and you do listen to the podcast every week, uh, we've noticed that 76.2 percent of you aren't subscribed to the channel if you're watching on YouTube. So if you could just say huge, huge favour, just hit the subscribe button down below. It's completely free to you, and it helps us to bring you these podcasts every single week. Uh, shall we do some listeners' comments? Getting, yes. your, getting your getting your clue so on there, looking at the stats and yeah, figures there, George. We got we got we got a uh, specific. I'd Joe oh, out with his uh, his head magnifying headset. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> looking at the data. The Look at the data. <laughs> and I was like, oh, it's actually seventy six point one. Okay. <laughs> uh, so let's do some comments, shall we? Uh, Balls Mahoney says, motivation like the gym comes after you start. You'll notice you never want to start, but once you get going, it becomes more difficult to stop. Yeah. Through that, that's yeah. in regards to the motivation uh, topic that we done last week. That yeah. was probably like my favourite thing uh, coming away from that episode and that conversation that we had was what you said about the parallels of you going to the gym. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's funny because like I feel like I'll talk about it to you lot, and you you know more about the painting stuff than the gym stuff, and then I'll try and talk about it in the gym, and none of them know about the painting <laughs> stuff. So I'm, I'm certain I just sound like a lunatic, but. You see it on, I mean, there's there's plenty of other You're in people. the gym doing your lifts. Like, no, no, it's like Space Marines. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have I have spoken about it a little bit with like people in the gym and a lot of people, surprising people know at least what it is. Mm. Like a surprising amount of people at least know what it is. We've said this before. When you speak to someone about Warhammer, it goes one of two ways. They'll be like, oh, what's that? Or like, you're try and dumb it down for them. They'll be like, what do you mean? Like Warhammer? Yeah, obviously. Yeah. yeah, that's literally what happened. I think I mentioned it before maybe on... on you even know so, or you don't know. <laughs> like uh, Jamie, who owns the gym, hmm. I was like explaining my job to him and like trying to put it in like businessy terms and da, da da And he was like, oh, what does the company do? And I was like, oh, we like, kind of paint like... Da, da, da. I was trying to explain like board game models and stuff and he was like what like Warhammer and I was like well yeah like obviously if I knew you knew that then yeah I would uh, I would just, uh, well, I would I just say that, that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah so it's funny either way it goes but yeah it's, it's um, I, I mean there's loads of pages out there of like it, I, I find you get more like um, like Instagram accounts and things of like PTs or people that come feels like they come from a fitness background first and then they start embracing their love for Warhammer similar to like boxy from Vanguard Tactics and things fitness background and then also embrace their love for Warhammer feels like I don't see as many going the other way in terms of like yeah, actual Instagram accounts and things but you can find loads of, of people that have probably found those parallels as well do you know we shouted out a listener the other week who uh, listens to us while they're what well, they installing dentures or something like that yeah, yeah, yeah we've got yeah. a competitor for you uh, Fat Maru says I'm a coffee roaster there's nothing quite like a bit of organizing the warehouse. So I listen to you guys while I use a forklift. Oh, that worries me. <laughs> that worries me. Listening to some of this while operating heavy operating machinery. Heavy machinery. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, if it's working so far, then fair enough. That is a cool, that's a cool one. I'm, I'm a just, coffee drinker. Same. So yeah. it's nice to have coffee a coffee enthusiasts. roaster. I feel like yeah. the synergy there is. Yeah. It's nice to have I've a, just got visions of them doing burnouts in the car park. with Burnouts <laughs> on a forklift. <laughs> You, you can tell James is really familiar with the uh, <laughs> interoperations of a warehouse. I, I, I've driven a forklift before, thank you. What have you been doing? Burnout. You'd be surprised how fast they go. Doing donuts. Did you do a burnout? In, in I mean, I tried. It didn't work, but yeah. 
impaled some of his colleagues, but you know. I bet they do go faster than you think. They are, they are very yeah. quick. I like those shows. You know when they'll just turn something that's just like not a race vehicle into a race Into vehicle. a race vehicle. Yeah. 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 Supermarket trolley. I mean, that's a bit jackass, but yeah. you get yeah. what I'm saying. Lawnmower <laughs> racing. You know when you see that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, Requiem Wraith says, the difficulty of moving paint from Citadel pots to dropper bottles is the entire reason I don't buy Citadel paints. I can tell the word the word difficulty is triggering his eyes twitching as he read difficulty then. You need you need a neon sign that flashes that guy and drop a bottle. <laughs> nee, nee, drop bottle. Right, I've covered this to death, right? It's not difficult. I've done a PSA on this. I've done video on TikTok. We've spoken about it on the podcast. I like Citadel paints. The, the pots don't gel with my workflow personally as a wet palette airbrush user. I like the dropper bottles. It takes seconds. It's not difficult. It's worth it. I think people feel like rather than it maybe being difficult, people feel like they're losing out on paint. Or just don't do it. Saying that, I did it and George, just, George ridiculed I did roast my, you attempt, the wrong bottles. my attempt at every, every step of it. The bottles were wrong. The labels weren't neat. Hang on. The, Let's back up here. I Actually, what happened if you remember correctly, I brought in my dropper bottles and you looked at them and you went, oh, they're a lot nicer than mine. I got the wrong ones. I'll have the link, please. Well, I mean, he I has know. got you there. To be well, fair. it's on camera. So we're all, we're all... <laughs> also, you put the labels on like sideways. What was that about? Because I just couldn't be bothered. <laughs> and you're complaining about the results. <laughs> well, I'm sitting there. This I've is got user like, error. Right, I'm sitting there. I've got like Caliban green on my fingers where I'm like <laughs> been pouring it and everything. It's got everywhere and it's all like goopy. And then, like, I'm trying to get the the label off and 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 back on the other one. Well, so, if you so watch my TikTok, Joe, taking the label off is step so what one. you should have done is you should have had the Inception soundtrack playing, so it makes it even more epic, <laughs> so that so, so like, that so that you so that you, it looks better as you're doing it. It well. just at least looks better. Yeah, I take the label off first because that way, if you spill any paint, it doesn't go on the label. Yeah, look, this is all very good points. <laughs> <laughs> I've been there now. I've done it. It's too late. Uh, this is also from Requiem Wraith, coincidentally, but I thought this was a good one. Uh, coming from the point of view of someone who started painting in the mid-2020, uh, I have to disagree that a beginner will just destroy their brushes. My first brushes were sable hair brushes. I still have them now, and they're still in decent condition. From watching a few videos before buying things, I knew sable hair brushes uh, needed looking after, so I learned how to do just that before buying them. A little time spent learning before making any purchases can help avoid issues a typical beginner will face. That's exactly what I thought when, I, when we talked about it. I was like, if you're going to invest time to look for good Kalinsky brushes, you're most probably going to look about how to look after good Kalinsky brushes. So I, I think that... I think the angle me and Joe were tackling it from was if you're someone who is being pushed it from someone else I was and about you don't have that, that baseline knowledge. Yeah, no, The I get point that. was actually whether you would recommend them to, yeah. to a beginner. And I wouldn't really because and look what they've said is is perfect and obviously the way to go around things and obviously an example of how it works. However, it however however <laughs> however if you um, if you don't have that inclination and you're looking at all that yourself, then it's not gonna uh, it's not gonna end as well. Yeah, I think possibly. there's a bit of a difference between like someone who's this seems like the sort of person who, like, before they get into a hobby, like, I was a bit like this. Before I picked up the Warhammer stuff, I'm the sort of person, before I get into anything, I'll do, like, loads of research on it because that's just kind of part of the enjoyment process for starting out. Like, before I buy anything, I'll watch, like, loads of videos on, like, what's the right thing to buy for this hobby, how to get started in that, whatever, and I'll kind of over-research it. If you're that sort of person, we're pro that's, that advice probably isn't targeted to you anyway. This is the sort of person who, oh, my friend's thinking about getting into Warhammer. Like, what should I recommend them? If you chuck a yeah. I mean, sable brush in front that, of them, the in it. That, obviously, the comment was aimed at the the comment about um, that uh, a beginner would destroy mm. the brushes, which was maybe a bit um, over the top. But um, I still think there's some merit in something that I personally do when I'm like learning something new, especially when it comes to equipment and things like that, is I do think there's benefit to learning on lesser equipment. So that you can fully appreciate the better equipment and what it's like. It's like learning guitar or something. Like I didn't go out and buy a jazz master when I decided to learn how to play guitar. You Should know, have done great guitar. Like, yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> but like, I learned how to play on like an an eighty pound encore. I had an strat, encore as well, you know. I had an encore strat. 
Red Mine was one. black. Mine was red. Cruiser by um, car. And it came with. Cruiser, cruiser by, was my cruiser, second. Cruiser yeah. by car. <laughs> and, it, and it came and it came with like a little thing, and and you learn how to play guitar on that because I wouldn't I wouldn't been able to appreciate. I've it. I've actually, but, funny enough, I have heard this. This clearly goes into any hobby because I've heard people in the guitar space saying not to do that and to get a nice guitar to start. So I guess it's kind of just yeah, just goes over, point, right? just goes over both. Like, I think it's just uh, maybe it's just me personally. I like to. I feel like I progress better with something if I learn on like with with poorer tools and then for me the financial part is like not something to gloss over because if you're just starting out and you've got nothing that's also, that budget, obviously obviously yeah. the financial thing is is there as well but like spending that money on those brushes like could be better spent elsewhere probably if you know what I mean I think it's like I said in that episode or I potentially said I can't remember but I only got good brushes when it got to a point where I was like I should not be spending my money on models. Mm. I've bought too many models, like, but I want to improve my painting experience, I guess. So I've been painting a little while now. Oh, I'll spend money on brushes. Yeah. And a lamp. And everything it's else. funny as well, because it's not this like binary price point either. Cause like you can get nice, decent Kalinsky Sable brushes for six quid and you can also get them for like 65 quid. Do you know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. And anything in between. Yeah. I think if you're, if you're the sort of person like this commenter, when you're going to do your research and you're going to make sure you take care of, things and stuff then knock yourself out I don't think there's anything against it yeah I agree uh, this was something that you pointed out to me uh, I didn't realise that uh, we've been getting a few uh, reviews in on the old audio platforms mm. uh, if you are listening on uh, either Spotify or Apple Podcasts or any of those platforms uh, please do us a favour do uh, follow us on there and also if you could leave us a rating that would be much appreciated well even if you're watching us on YouTube yeah, you know, if you're watching us on YouTube and you've over never there. listened to us on Apple Podcasts, head over to Apple Podcasts. Head over there and leave a review, please. <laughs> uh, RWBFA says, uh, I listen to many painting pods and most of them are really good. This one, however, is the S tier gold standard of painting pods. That's it. We're done. We're done. It's a wrap. <laughs> uh, they're humorous, informative, organized, have really good chemistry, and I can listen to them with the kids in the car without having to worry about a bunch of F-bombs being thrown about. Uh, if you're not listening to these guys, you're missing out. Cheers, fellas, from the US. And thank you for this outstanding content. Perfect. That's the perfect review. Babe Ruth of comments. Yeah, that is the perfect review. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, thank massive you. massive thanks. It. That's appreciated hugely. Yeah. Just a quick one. We wanted to remind you that you can get your own miniatures painted by the world-class team here at Seed Studios. We offer a variety of painting levels and services to meet your needs and budget. Whether you want a centerpiece character or an entire gaming army, we offer well above the industry standard of quality and experience. You can learn more about our services and get a quote now at cstudios.co.uk. And just for you podcast listeners, you can get 5% off of your first commission with us by using code PAINT5. Now back to the show. Topic this week, army painting. It's a bit of a bit of a crux for many people. Mm -hmm. uh, I've painted quite a few armies, James. You've painted quite a few armies? Yes. Joe, you've painted tens of models. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> um, as you say, I'm not the best equipped to answer any of this. I think I don't think I'll have too much to say. I like it when we get your uh, paint perspective on, uh, on these sorts of topics, though, because I feel like me and James Outsiders will view. row about some methodology and then you'll come in as like the voice of reason are you are you saying Pick that you're, you're going to be mine and george's robin not batman <laughs> yeah yeah I, I can't i i like if you're going to be robin can you be like michael sarah robin from the lego movie how do you always get michael sarah michael sarah has had way too many mentions on this podcast yeah. for, for a warhammer podcast uh, right uh keywords uh, uh matt kennedy uh <laughs> <laughs> I thought it'd be really good to talk about all the tips that we have learned to help you paint your army faster and better. Because I believe personally, you can have your cake and eat it. There are some trade-offs and you've got to be calculated in how you approach it to get like the best of both, I think. But whenever I see videos or hear people talking about like, oh, I'm using this to paint my army faster, there's normally the trade-off of quality. And if you want to paint really high quality, there's normally the trade-off of speed. But I feel like combination of like there's a middle ground and like i said if you're calculated and you play your cards right you can be more efficient at painting really really well and you can paint really really well faster through repetition if that makes sense uh so i thought we could uh go through a little list i've come up with some of my own notes uh but i'm interested in james i presume you're going to be talking about batch painting and your uh your process for that i'm going to be talking about ppe that's what i'm talking about ppe, PPE. plan process execution 
that's what we're going to talk about. PPE. <laughs> Not the personal protection stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you'll do this. You'll come up with your own James-ism, like abbreviation, yeah. and you'll throw it out as if it's like a thing. That's how it. That's how it catches on. Like if you want, if you want a new nickname, you have to just start saying it about yourself. Yeah. Or, or mentioning that people have called it to you yourself. It's a good point, Dragon. All right, <laughs> <laughs> All right Robin. Yeah. So like, it's the same thing. If he, if you just is with these abbreviations, he's he's faking it till he makes it. He just says them and then enough people will start saying But he saying doesn't them. make it. He just fakes it. <laughs> no, enough people will start saying them. Plan, enough people start saying them and then, and plan, then it happens. Process. Right. Execution. I'm putting it in James isn't territory. Okay, uh, that's fine. Well, okay, what is PPE then? Plan, process and execution. So I always talk about a journal. First thing on, on in, in the P, which is the planning stage of it. Um, journal up the idea of the project. Thoughts things you're uncertain about, things you're unsure about, do some swatches. That half hour, hour of planning is going to help massively through the longevity of the project uh, and for the life of the army. So if you continue adding to it for years to come, that an hour or half an hour is so wisely spent making a lot of the things concrete that you want to take forward. Do you think that if you're like, say, a bit into a project, say you've already done like one phase and you want to like add some models. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's still merit to that planning phase if you've already kind of started? Does that make I sense? Think, I think, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Even if you've done like, let's just say you're listening to this now and you've not ever, never done a plan for your army or your project. I think going backwards and going, right. Okay. I've done a thousand points, 2000 points, whatever. I suppose you've done the hard work because you've already picked the color scheme, right? Yeah. It's yeah. There. Do you know, it actually, it's, it makes the planning a bit easier because you uh, already made a lot of the decisions. So you don't need to necessarily do that within the half hour, hour, however long you spend planning. Obviously, the more time you spend planning, the better it's going to be. But I suppose you could still like map out the order of events and whatnot. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 I think it potentially changes the context of some of the planning because you could, it adds in things you would change from yeah. what you've done previously. Yeah. yeah. Which obviously isn't something you have to think I'd about. I'd still always anymore. advocate doing it at the beginning when mm. you start. But if you are in a situation where you've got an army, um, then yeah, got retroactively going back and writing it up so that you've got something that you can relate to in years to come or whenever the new shiny model comes out or whatever. I think definitely I think definitely that's something that um that I would recommend. Um I think color choice is a massive part of the planning style, side of it as well, as we always talk about colors, you know, if you're representing this material, if you're representing this, or, you know, you're going for this, or it's... You that know, ties into the speed thing, doesn't it? Because, like, making those decisions on the fly and potentially making a mistake and having to go back and repaint. Yeah, exactly. Massively into the time. The thing is, you don't, you, you don't count up and add up all those minutes and seconds where you're being Johnny on the spot and making decisions that uh, have no grounding behind them, if that makes sense. And then you retroactively go back and go, oh, I shouldn't use that color. Actually, I should use this one instead. And you relayer it over the top or whatever. Blah. Like you don't necessarily count all those seconds and minutes, but and then bear in mind that that is then multiplied by the amount of models that you've done that error or mistake or poor choice on. So it actually takes up quite a considerable period of time. Joe, um, you don't um, plan your projects, do you? But I know this is new to me, the painting journal thing. I don't, uh, I don't, fully like god you called him right out there like, yeah jesus no, I'm, say, I'm saying as someone what, as judging someone by looking at him or something. <laughs> <laughs> no i just wanted to interject there because i don't do this uh, well, in terms I, of I the journal thing ju fully journal necessarily but uh i notes app before i'm about to paint something just plan out color scheme pick the colors all that kind of thing the reason i asked was do you I, so I, that's like a journal in a way yeah it's just yeah not like but, I know James has his book and he swatches in the back and things like that. I don't have that, but the reason I asked was because I don't have a book journal and I am not the best at planning historically. And what you said does hit for me in terms of like time wastage, yeah, making decisions. So I, I wondered if you relate to that. I just I I like the just doing it on the notes app because then it, you know, I'll often have like my laptop. I can write it on my phone then. So I'll often. I'm not necessarily at my desk when I'm planning. It'll be like maybe I'm out and I'll, or something like that, and I'm like thinking about it that way. That, that's why I like having the journal with all the swatches in the back because it is something you can take away from your painting desk. Like you know, you don't necessarily like you don't necessarily need to uh, take brushes and paints with you when you travel. You can have all your swatches and things in the back of it, and you can sit on a train, playing whatever, blah blah, and you can still write all the notes and write all that stuff in the on the page. I think there's also something psychologically as well. Like as much as doing it digitally is great. And this isn't me trying to dig my claws in into like old school, like 
hard copy, which I've, I'm very fond of. But, but so as long as uh, digital is fine, but using a quill and uh, <laughs> ink is just. <laughs> I choose to believe that he sits there with a triple zero <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. and he paints it with, with his blood red. Because that is, you've got to practice brush control. So write in your plan. It's two in one. With yeah. 950 and a size triple zero, you have to write it in your book. Hey, well, I never said get medieval on this. Pure right, straight okay. line. That reminded me. That reminded me. This is this is a real tangent, but I have to throw it in because it did remind me because I said about the blood red. Yeah. Adam was in the other room earlier, and he went, "Oh, I've got some, I've got some leftover blood red, by the way." And James like turned his head, like, <laughs> like his ears pepped up, and he was like, "Oh, is it dried out?" And he was like, "Oh yeah, it's dried out. It's like one of the old ones." He goes, "I still have the bottle." I still have the bottle. Brilliant bottles, them. He goes, he goes, brilliant bottles, them. They're great for holding paint. They seal really well. And I was like, but did he just say <laughs> the paint was dry? dry. <laughs> hey, hey. It's, it's not on the thought of the bottle. It's on it potentially as the user. That lid couldn't been closed properly or there could be crap in the lid. You never know. So like, I've got plenty of those bottles and they they keep the paint nice and nice and wet well, still. So Sorry for that so, tangent. So, yeah. Yeah, I thought you were going to say that I I I, I jumped on the carcass of the red he blood did red that as well. blood red. There's a there was a ketchup, a ketchup, ketchup bottle. bottle in there. We uh, we done the Legion Imperialis project, and Adam mixed up like quite a big batch of blood red for it, and uh, I, I I I spied it out the corner of my. He's eye. like, there's about there's about one point seven milliliters of blood red in this uh, in this dry ketchup bottle. I'll be having that. Yeah, I was quicker on that carcass than a vulture. Like I was literally like I was straight on it. So so yeah. goes the first Jamesism of the episode. Yeah, yeah, there you go. But anyway. Yeah, so the planning well, part, No, PPE. PPE, yeah. Yeah, but that was like a true OG Jamesism. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. So the reason I, like, I actually like to write it down is because there's something psychological uh, that's proven that when you actually physically write it, it, it you memorize stuff better. Um, and as much as I love digital and love it, the ease of, of writing on a phone or writing on a tablet or even a laptop or something like that, physically writing it is proven to you absorb it and remember it a bit better. Um, I get that and I agree with that, but I don't need to remember it. No, no, so I'm no. not like... I do it in like a daily. Like here, you've a, got your book in front of you. I've got yeah, to remember it right? on, a, on yeah. a on a daily basis. I'll write stuff down at work and like things I need to remember because that's definitely a thing. But yeah, painting, planning, recipe thing. I don't really need to remember that off offhand. I suppose the upside. I know you said you can take your painting journal around with you, but the upside of like the notes app on your phone is even if you're somewhere it's where literally you I just like that I can I can write it on my phone and then I can just open my laptop and it's there yeah no I agree and, and, I agree. and things like that yeah, um, there is the ease oh I can change it on my laptop and then it's changed on my phone yeah, like, yeah. I much much prefer the ease of that I think no I, I get that the only, the only thing I'd ever say about something digital is you can't put swatches on it that are 100 percent. there is that is yeah. a fair point yeah, yeah. Paper yeah. Thing. yeah that's yeah. the only that's the only one of the one of the real uh, uh, uh sort of bits of do you find that the color is accurate to how it will look on plastic. It desaturates ever so slightly, but mm. that's why if you use grey toned paper, it kind of helps with that a little bit. Yeah. Um, you know, uh white would potentially punch it up a bit brighter potentially. But yeah, I I I'd, I'd always go on a mixed medium grey toned. Especially if you didn't get close enough, it yeah. serves its purpose though. Mm, yeah. yeah. I, th I think it's a lot closer than the swatches that you tend to find on digital products. Like I know there's a lot of paint apps and things like that, but I don't think the swatches are as close as well, the, the problem with digital is like screen to screen you're dealing with different yeah yeah signs. exactly it's never gonna be one to one exactly yeah. so the next part of like ppe is like is the process which i think arguably is just as important as the first stage of pl which is planning um and i think obviously actually executing stuff uh in order um is and the way the choices that you make in the process stage of doing an army really dictates and, and determines the time sync the efficiency, the uh, the execution quality as well, and also the, the consistency as well. Um, so you're specifically talking about the order of which you do things? Yeah, 100%. Is that 100%, what it comes yeah, down to? Yeah. Really? Is like, that for so speed or for quality? For both speed and quality. Um, a lot of people, as I've mentioned before, will do like bases separate to models. Um, and that I understand for certain circumstances and situations, but a lot of the time, just being neat around the feet with putting basic material on or PVA and stuff like that. The time that you have to focus and invest on to just being neat around the feet to get that that PVA on to then put the material on. It's a much shorter amount of time than doing the whole by all the bases as a as a as a process individually separate to the models. That's why, for example, the any kind of texture paint in the games workshop texture paints are actually also very very good if you're trying to. Do an army consistently quite quickly you can easily use those texture paints on on bases with the models with their feet on the, the glue to the bases and it saves you arguably a lot of time i hard disagree on the base thing because i find that the amount of adjusting like, say the argument that i've heard you make for not doing the bases separate is when you stick the model on they're kind of like 
floating over the surface, right? They're floating over the surface. You have pins showing. You have feet. That you're sticking. You're sticking a model because the thing is, you're sticking a model onto a basing material, which is then stuck onto the base. Now, if you haven't scored the base with the knife pre-putting any basing material on, the basing material is only going to be stuck onto that base by by any kind of contact adhesive that it contains within it. By super gluing or gluing poly cement or whatever, the model to the physical base, there is no way that base is coming off. And what will happen is that the basic material that you put on cements around the feet and helps the whole thing stay together a lot better as well. I've found though that the time trade, because I'll, I'll usually pin them to the base, that's how I get around that. I found for me personally, I think this is an individual thing. It is, yeah. I can batch like tons and tons of bases with the model off way, way, way quicker than having to like brush the PVA on around their feet and be careful and do any cleanup. What I'll find that I'll do is when I pin them to the base after the fact, if they are like floating a little bit, I'll use that GW texture paste just around the feet, just as like a gap filler almost. Yeah. And I found for myself that net overall, that's a quicker process doing a little touch up for the feet rather than being really, really careful in the application in the first place. And also I can get like 30 bases on a big board yeah. and I can dry brush more of a massive brush. It's like yeah, one of process. I, I think the thing is, is like if you're accustomed to doing it in that way, I think yes, a hundred percent. Um, but I think that doing it with the models attached to the bases, it's uh, your your focus and attention, which is again is something that is not infinite. You have a, an X amount of because you could let's just say it this way: you could do the bases in a batch or in a big batch, and that could be a session for a day. Whereas if you do the model, the bases on the models, and you're just careful around the feet and put the basic material on carefully around the feet, not only are you training your hand to be more refined and careful and delicate, which is cr creating uh, refinement of execution but at the same time it just means that your focus and attention is on one thing and you're not doing two workflows which mm. which I, I think when you start separating this is again why i'm going to talk about sub assemblies in a second like i think this is why reducing the amount of dilution of attention and time and, and, and time investment helps massively to just get to that end goal whichever part of the process you're, you're going through so i'd always personally advocate Look, when it comes to the process, trying to not sacrifice the quality for the what you're trying to execute, whether it's a gaming quality, whether it's whatever, but just making choices on the process which are going to mean that you are not diluting your attention because that's the thing that's gonna that's the thing that's gonna make you either achieve the finished product or not. If that makes sense, I think when you're taking on board, like listening to someone else explain their process for something. I think you need to understand that what they're not telling you is this is 100% the best way to do it. Yeah, exactly. For you. Mm -hmm. What they're telling you is this is how I've found it's best to do it for me. So it might work for you as well. Precisely. And this is a great example because you've both got two. I kind of flip-flop between the both, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, and I've kind of tried both. I haven't tried any on like a broad scale. On the kill team that I've just done, I did it the James way, which I haven't done in a while. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, I did find that easier, I think, or just like it flowed, the workflow flowed nicer for me. Cause I, I like that by the time I'm, it goes down to the sub assembly thing as well, I think. But like by the time I'm priming them, you're not, exactly because you're not thinking of like the setup time to prime the bases. You're not like, you've got yeah. to prime both. Whereas when you prime, I'm sure the actual painting of the bases would be quicker your way. Yeah, 100%. I suppose it's yeah. partially relevant to the way I like to paint, where I do prefer having the model not on the base because I find it easier because that, I've not got the base in the way. I can tip the model all, that's more exactly or less upside down. One of the points I was going to make was that that. That is a key part as to which one of these is going to work for you. Also, you want... the model though, because if it's if it's like say uh, like a blade guard vet, and they've got like a tablet in between the legs, I like being able to get the brush from the underside I, I'm gonna rather than coming at it from the back. I'll say this right now: uh, I, I stick to my process quite gospelly, being honest, because I've done it for so long, and it work, as you're quite right, it works for me. Is I'm not sitting there dictating that this is the way, you know, in a, in a you know, but in a Mandalorian style comment, but the but the the, the even the model I'm doing now, so the Night Lord, like that is off the base because of the cape, mm -hmm. because the cape is attached. And having the cape and the base is like an L shape kind of like guard to the model. It makes actually executing stuff a lot harder yeah. um, or not even possible. I'll so, tie that so, into your point about the planning phase, like yeah. even thinking ahead to the macro level of, okay, 
overall I think it'd be quicker if this type of model I do this process for yeah, maybe yeah. separating things out like oh okay this is part of why I like painting models in squads because normally they'll be the same as each other right I mean there are a few odd squads that there are a few different fringe models, cases in the unit but yeah generally speaking like yeah. they're the same type of same type of model yeah I like to break them up for that reason for example like you said like with like a blade guard vet or uh, with like some crusaders or something like that where they've got like a load of cloth in between the legs and some hard to access areas I'd want to leave them separate but then maybe you've got like just a bunch of like normal intercessors or tap marines or something like that you might want to do it on the base with yeah. base textured yeah no no 100 percent. as i said just i think it, it, there is a case-by-case -case basis but the sole the sole thing i'm trying to point out with it is it, it should be uh, uh, stepping back and assessing obviously the amount of time you're investing into those things and if like you should be steering yourself to be as efficient with the time because that's factually the one thing you're not going to get any more of to not try and sound too morbid but but that is the thing that like you need to look at and go right this is where I want to get to and do these choices allow me to get to that point without sacrificing the quality but giving me the best time efficiency for doing it I think that's the angle that I would try and steer anyone yeah off. I guess it is important to work out what's more important to you in terms of the the time and uh quality thing because I've said you can have your cake and eat it and I do believe that you can in most cases but there's probably gonna be a couple of little sticklers where you've got a way up okay this might get me worse quality but it will be much, much faster. And then I can spend that saved time on something else, which might have a, a higher net benefit of quality, if that makes sense. Yeah. So like, okay, I might be able to sacrifice some time in my basing process, uh, like what you were saying about how it's more efficient for you to do the, the basing texture at the same time as sticking the model to the base. I might be able to save some time there and invest it somewhere else. Like, oh, okay, I can do an extra uh, investment of time in like the lenses on like the weapons and make something stand out a bit more, make it look a bit more special. Trading those, yeah. those blows for getting the best result right i think that's the important part of the plan that's process. what i'm saying so like the time that you save on that is then time that at the end of the process where you've not spent as much doing that at the first hand you can go oh i'm going to paint the lenses actually i'm going to paint the screen on this tank or i'm going to paint this whatever you know blah blah i think that's where you can trade that time you've saved for then value onto the miniature at a later stage yeah um but yeah, yeah. i i suppose i i'm a bit of a sucker for like really really simple bases because it's so quick and it's like it's a non-thought like I really do love models that have got like lovely basing and I would I would love to do that for all my models. But I would, in my opinion, when I look at my own stuff, I'd rather have a model that's painted better on a plain base than a model that was painted pretty good, maybe not as good with a great base. Do you, do it does depend on like, the model. Do you, not, but do you not feel like a really good base in terms of, I feel like in terms of like time of investment, you can make a base look a lot better for not a lot of time. Mm. Do you not think that elevates the model a little bit? Like it elevates them. If you had the same model, same level of painting, the mm. one with the better base just instantly like feels. I agree better. with that, but this is my point of like trying to score points because I feel like with my own stuff to get a base that looks, maybe this is just down to my painting style and maybe I need to get better at basing, but to do a better base, I would have to in the same amount, say I had the same amount of time total for a project to get a better sacrifice base, I would have to time. sacrifice something on the model. And for some people that might be worth it because say you're super good at basing, it might outweigh that. But for me, I don't think it does. Yeah. Yeah, fair, fair. I think that kind of, you sort of ended up touching on it anyway, but one of the things I was going to jump in because we were quite heavily talking about just the preferable way to do the basing. Mm -hmm. But both the arguments and the takeaways or whatever from that conversation, I think can be applied to almost any part of the process oh, of, yeah. of, of doing the army um because like the reasons that one of those the basin uh things works for james and doesn't work for you that can be applied to almost anything you're going to do on the army i think as well yeah so it felt like we were only talking about basin but i was just it's not it's, it's, i felt like a lot of the things that were said it kind of covers a lot of a lot of ground really yeah that's a bit of a pun didn't mean didn't mean <laughs> yeah. if you're enjoying the show and you want to get even more painting tips and techniques from us here at siege head over to our Patreon. With the Siege Studios Patreon, you'll gain access to a catalogue of over 250 PDF and video tutorials covering a variety of techniques from our foundation tutorials to full character masterclasses and much more. We also have a tier just for you podcast listeners to help support the show. So if you want to take your paintings to the next step and make the most of your hobby time, head over to patreon.com forward slash Siege Studios. What was your thing on sub assemblies? No, I was just gonna say, like again, it's a dilution of attention. Like if you're you're looking at an insular little piece of of the model and focusing on that, your attention isn't on the wider, bigger picture, which is the army. 
You um, can go both ways with subassembly so much, I feel like. Because on the one hand, you can be way more efficient with subassemblies, but you can also be way more inefficient because you've broken it down so many yeah, times. Do you, know, do you know what as well with subassemblies? Um, I know obviously I've spoken about them before, but if it was coming down to an army mm -hmm. and I had to do subassemblies, like even just physically like having the room, like yeah. I don't have a huge painting desk. I don't have a lot of room to keep like trays of, of like, Corks or something, corks yeah. or whatever on or shot glasses or shot glasses, yeah. Um, which is what I've been using on the the kill team actually. Um, got not not using the Jenga got rid of the pieces. Jenga, not rid of the, <laughs> got rid of the Jenga pieces on these ones. Um, well, no, James recommended specific shot glasses that I wasn't going to crack in my hands, and I haven't so far, so that's good. Um, so yeah, the, the actual space that you have for me comes down. Like, I hate feeling like really kind of closed in on my painting desk and it's not massive. So if I had loads of sub assemblies and I was doing, if I was doing an army mm -hmm. and I had like loads of sub assemblies, I just wouldn't even have the room to organize it all. And I feel like that would cause chaos. There, as are, well. there, there are three, in my opinion, this is purely an opinionated statement. There are three things that come down to why you should sub assembly access. First one, if you can access Does this not go into a nice little, doesn't have an abbreviation for this one. Abbreviation. I mean, we can make one if you want. Yeah. yeah. So, so access, which, oh, then, because oh, now, now I'm thinking of the order I should say the thing. <laughs> <laughs> to make the best abbreviation. So go possible. on, go on, you got this. You've said access now, so that's got to be first. Access, access is yeah. the first one. Okay. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> trying to think of a better one. I've got, got it, I've got it. I was trying to think of which access, interest. Yeah. Because, a head, a bare head, for example, or a specific like lid or helmet, like would be would be like you might want to paint that and focus the attention of someone that okay. Uh, and I've done it in this order on purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, and the last one is magnetizing. So that spells aim, and it's very oh, relevant. To aim. 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 aim, didn't you know? Everyone knows aim. aim. Do you not know aim? Come Everyone on, knows like, aim. Yeah. yeah. So so access. You just said aim. We would have been like, oh yeah, obviously. Yeah. Access, interest, and magnetizing. They're the three things. Yeah. You got to do the head bob with it as well. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. Uh, you got the reason why is because those three things, in my personal opinion, dictate what whether you should or shouldn't access. Obviously, being the first one, can you access everything on the model? You want to fully, you know, in my opinion, it would be good to fully paint all the details and bits on your models to, to show that you've actually added the interest and, and, and effort into those parts of the models. Again, bolters across chest, gun across chest, things like that. If you can't access it, if you can't access it, then obviously. Don't do the gun separately, etc. I did on the 30, 30k Age, uh, Age of Darkness box, Blood Angels. All the arms were separate as one as one thing. I have thing. a point on that. If I could uh, briefly interrupt, jump in. I I don't have an abbreviation for this, unfortunately. I'm quite fond of. I thought that was the start of it. I <laughs> <laughs> like you. I don't have a massive painting space, and I go for what I in my head think of as like a tactical sub assembly. Hear me out. Say with like an intercessor or attack marine, whatever. That is the classic, right? You can't get to the Aquila on the chest because the gun's in the way. Is this the glue thing? No, 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 no. Okay. I'll sub-assembly stuff and immediately the first thing I'll do is paint that area that's covered. So the first thing I can do is glue the arms back on right. yeah, and yeah, get that like yeah. out of the way. So it's like, yeah. I've got a sub-assembly, but it's only going to be for like a couple of hours yeah. while I get that out of the way. Yeah, yeah. So it's not that's like I'm stuck yeah. with these sub-assembly because normally with sub-assemblies, you think of it as like, I'm going to paint every individual part to completion and then glue it all together at the end. I won't do that. I'll, I'll often start project in sub-assemblies, but the second I can get away with gluing it on the model, it's going on. Yeah, do you no, know I agree. What? I, agree. I actually, I have to do this on a on a model, and that's the, this is the conclusion that I came to. In the Gaunt's Ghosts thing that I said I was building, mm -hmm. um, I don't know the individual name of them, but the guy who's got the tree branch, and he's like got his foot up on the tree oh, branch, and he's, name. he's got the blade yeah. and he's holding it off. The way that kit, it's a really cool model and it's a really cool kit, but the way that that kit's done is there's on his like cloak, um, his cloak kind of like makes up his back. So he's like got his body piece and then you stick the cloak on the back, which builds up his shoulders and everything as well. And um, on the inside of the cloak, he has his dagger like sheath, like, and when the model's all together, mm -hmm. At one certain angle, you can see some of it mm -hmm. from in between his legs. So you do need to paint it because you can see it at some point. It. Yeah, you can hardly see it anywhere uh, anywhere else. And most of it that's actually even sculpted, you can never see. It's completely taken up by by his back. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna have to do that in a sub assembly. There's no way I can 
neatly paint that tiny little bit in between his legs. But the problem with that is, is if you do that as a sub assembly, you obviously can't build, he hasn't got any shoulders or anything like yeah, that. Yeah. You can't, the way that he, because his, his cloak comes like around his neck yeah, and, and he's got a hood up. Cloth does suffer, especially for this. So there's yeah. a join yeah. line yep. um, from when it comes over the shoulders and goes around here. And that's a separate piece in front of him. So you basically, it's those one of those ones, you know where you like clip the head in? Mm hmm it's one of those. Yeah. So in terms of doing it in like sub assemblies, you can't really like build the full model until you painted the knife. Like, cause even if I wanted to break the back off afterwards, like mm. doing the super glue thing, then everything else has got to come off as well. And that, that seam line between the bit of cloth wouldn't be able to be filled or anything like that. Just to explain that super glue thing that was on a previous episode where I told Joe, you can do, not do sub assemblies, but when you put the model together, you just use a tiny, tiny dot of super glue so, then you so that you can off. break it apart well later in the yeah. painting process. Yeah, so that wouldn't work. So basically, I'm going to have to paint like the inside of the cloak first, I think, prime everything. And then once I've painted the inside of the cloak, actually put the model yeah. together. Yeah. So that's like I said, like you kind of sub assembly, but then midway reassemble, yeah. even though you're still painting. Yeah. I do this for, um, you know, the prim Primaris uh, Eliminators, the Space Marine mm. uh, sniper guys with the yeah, cloaks. Yeah. They have some, probably a similar thing, right? Yeah, they have some like the part of the fabric drapes over the shoulder, so it's like a part of the arm and the front piece. So, because it, it's in multiple pieces, the cloth, but the cloth is attached to bits of body part. Mm -hmm. So, when you attack, when you put them all together, you need to sort of gap fill the cloth and get like a nice seam on that. But you can't do that. Because you need to get your brush access in yeah, areas where the cloth is. Like you, you already would have primed it and everything. Exactly. So you've got to kind of do this thing, in my opinion, this is how I do it. Sub assemblies. First things first, paint the bits I won't be able to reach later. Yeah. Then put the more finish putting the model together and then gap fill and then go back. You're sort of doing this yeah. This midway sub assembly. Wim kind yeah. of it's lucky for yeah. this one, like I say, it's like almost entirely hidden. Mm -hmm. So I could potentially even just like prime that bit. Yeah, fully paint that bit, put some putty over it or something, and yeah. then fully build and prime the rest of the model, and then take the putty off or something like that. Yeah, like, yeah. I, that, that's the thing. Like the 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 access is one of the biggest things when it comes to that. Like the, the three things that I that I look for when it comes to making choices about sub assemblies. But yeah, like that's a very relative point. And again, having the, choosing whether you can access it or not is important. Obviously, the interest is the next thing. So like, if it's something that's very important, so like a bare head, you really want to one of the things that instantly as a human you recognize because since a baby you look at people's faces and recognize it's a person you know so those kind of things and if it's something that's really an interesting or focal part of the model and it is a separate piece it might be really interesting to do that separately just so you can focus it's more about focusing your attention in an insular way on that specific item i'd like to overlap that with the point that i had on my list which was when people think about like speed and quality the whole you can't have it both thing, you would assume that to be fast, you have to skip on details. Yeah. But obviously, I high-quality miniatures have high-quality details down to like quite a finite level, right? Yeah. Like everything's painted super well. Mm -hmm. The leather texture, the pouches, things that, things that I find are normally the first things that people cull in terms of speed mm. are some of the most important things for making a model look really, really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So for example, you might skip out like uh, painting all the leather because it's like a darker detail and you can sort of get away with it. And you can, like tabletop stuff. But I find that if stuff like that is painted really, really nicely, that adds tons of value to the model. Mm. Whereas if you'd painted the power armor a bit quicker and you didn't do slap chop, you just did like a zenith all. But you got the really nice leather texture. That model might look better overall, in my opinion. Mm. Yeah. So where I found that that overlapped was something that I was doing for a brief period of time when I was painting a few years ago was I was doing really, really quick models, but I was really, really enjoying painting faces at the time. And that was when I was starting to like practice that quite a lot. And I would have models that I just like Zenith or one edge done really, really quick, but I put like a really well painted face on it. And I spent probably double the amount of time on the face as I did the rest of the entire model. Mm -hmm. I still have those models in my cabinet and I think they look great. Because yeah. like you said, your eyes drawn to the face. Correct, it is, you yeah. see it as like this awesome model and you can overlook so much. Whereas if I had that model, and the arm was painted really, really well. And the face was just sort of, you know, painted, put a wash in it, put a highlight on it. I don't think the whole model was look as good. No. I actually yeah. think that's potentially the biggest takeaway from this whole conversation is like to paint, if you're focusing on painting something faster and better, then spend time on 
smaller details. It's kind of like do the complete opposite of what everyone else tells you to do. They're yeah, like, yeah. oh, skip all the details, just focus on yeah. the broad strokes. Spend strategy. more time on those details because that will give the impression that you spend, spend loads time, of time, time on, time on, on exactly, And you can yeah. take shortcuts elsewhere. Like yeah. the, for example, like the ribbing on like a space marine, like the undersuit, you can do that as just a base coat. Great, now you've saved five minutes. Put three highlights on the lens of his scope. Yeah. Exactly. It'll really stand out. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone will go, oh, look how, look how well that scope's been done. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they're not looking at the rubberized armor in between the, the, the armor segments. But yeah, yeah, no, exactly. So interest is the next thing. And then the last one, which is always in that order of interest, of like of that order of like thought process. Aim. aim. Not, so, <laughs> yeah. not so that it spells aim. Not that it's don't aim. don't that's say just, that. It's always just, in, it's in order of importance. That's just a happy coincidence. Yeah. It's just it perfect, it. perfect coincidence that it's in that order. Yeah. Yeah. He was right. not sitting there and we didn't cut out minutes of James scratching his head trying to come up with the perfect acronym. I literally, I came up with that on the fly. Yeah. Um, but um, it's magnetizing. Now, look, I realized that if you're magnetizing. Main, yeah, it is. Yeah, magnetizing as in all the additional parts. So you have to sub assembly. It's, 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 okay. it's, it's a sub You're magnetizing it, it's, it's arms and stuff. So it's like weapon, weapon options. So it's you? like if you're, we're, we're talking about. I'm this. baffled at your facial re I'm, reaction. I just don't to know this, where you're going like. with this. I feel like I've missed something. It's no, a sub assembly. It's a sub assembly, yeah, yeah. basically. But aim, aim is the, the free situation. Uh -huh. yeah. Come on, do you not keep up? <laughs> aim, aim is the free situation. <laughs> aim is the free situations in which you, you, can, you uh -huh. should use sub assemblies. Okay. So magnetizing is the third one. Yeah. You don't mean literally magnetizing. No. So so what I mean by it is no. It doesn't mean no. No. It doesn't mean okay, the act right. of magnet. Oh, the magnet is a Why is this so hard? It's not the cake, yeah. mate. Come I on. I thought you were trying right. to say that magnetizing it is like quicker or something. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. 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 Well, like magnet. Yeah. <laughs> magnetizing it onto your separate yeah, hole yeah. or no, something. No. So so essentially, um, you know, the, the choices of, of what we're doing sub is access, interest, and magnetizing. As in, like. If you're a lot of the people that are hopefully watching this video are because they want to paint armies quicker and paint armies better in a, in a shorter time frame, it's uh, you know most people who do armies. If you want to get maximum usage out of a kit, especially with a lot of the kits like tanks, uh, potentially heavier infantry, etc., like that, they you have a whole myriad of weapon options that that are um, that are obviously available to them. So what I would definitely advocate uh, when it comes to it is looking at the options that come with the kits. And deciding at a very early early stage which ones you definitely are going to be wanting to uh, add onto the stock weapon loadout. So let's just take I don't know. Let's just take a Sentinel as an example. Sentinel comes with a uh, multi melter, heavy flamer, las cannon, a multi laser, and I'm sure there's a missile pod or something like that. So for me personally, I would if I was doing an army, knowing that I'm going to probably want multiple weapon options for that specific kit, I will look at it and go right. I want something that's anti tank and I want something that's anti infantry. And then I would choose two options, which potentially give me the best split between those two things. And I'd choose those two options rather than going, oh, I'll do all of them. I was going to say, do you, like, I'm guilty of this as well. But for some reason, I think pretty much everyone, when they think of magnetizing, they, they, they mean... They just always mean, oh, I must have every option. Yeah. Like if I'm going to magnetize, I might, might as well do every. Even though you're probably only going to use two out of five. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, exactly. so strategically picking the ones you're actually going to use so, is yeah, so, probably a good way. And and magnetizing in itself is a good way to save time because some, often the alternative is buying another model. Full new models. Yeah, yeah Like exactly. a whole other box of models or Which something. Which I guess magnetizing can be tedious and time consuming but obviously not as much as painting not as much as painting time, the whole other one no yeah, exactly. especially if the aim is faster and better yeah, yeah. I like the way you use the pun um, but the oh aim yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so I didn't even so I, didn't so even I would literally that. I would literally look at a kit while you're and this is this can be done really early on in the building stage of, of the process um, and you can literally go right okay I know I'm going to be or I want something that's that's that you know I, I could magnetize every weapon option you know and the thing is like you said rather than doing another kit you can always go back and then just as long as you get the polarities correct you can always go back in and add those extra weapons on at a later date but i would factually look at it and go right i know that i'm doing a fairly competitive army or maybe i want some flexibility from the force but at the same time i don't want i want to install these extra options in my process while i'm cleaning while i'm building while i'm undercoating while i'm painting metallics or i'm painting this or whatever like and make that factual decision at that point and, then sit and go, right, I want something maybe that's anti-infantry, I want something that's anti-tank, or maybe I want this option. Maybe the character comes with a sword, a power fist, you know, a bolter, a plasma pistol, whatever. Picking some options at that build stage that then mean that you can be more efficient with your time when it comes to magnetizing 
that then gives you that flexibility once the army is done. Having that thought process, it just means that you're being you're, you're you're trimming down what you're using and what you're doing correct, but you're still got a little bit of that flexibility that you're hoping for for when it comes to gaming. And I think that helps you those three things. So to use the, the, the yeah, thing, that's that, that's that, the aim. That is the aim of of of, of, the of, aim. of when it comes to sub assemblies. Um, and that's that's the kind of approach that I, that I would I would recommend and advocate. So yeah. I think the last thing on my list is uh, efficiency when batch painting. Because I think batch painting is something that gets thrown around a lot and people don't get nuanced enough in the sense of you might think like, I'm going to paint uh, like a squad of my space marines one at a time as a batch. But I'll go like super detailed on this. Like I'm, I'm doing one color at a time. Like James says, order of majority. And I'm going through the list and I'll... As many as I can tolerate, I think is usually my rule for how big a batch will be. Like, say I've got like, let's take it to extreme. Say I've got like a hundred infantry to paint. If I could do a hundred, just painting brown belts all day, I'll do it. Odds are I can't, but I'll do like the maximum I could physically handle yeah. without getting bored to tears. Yeah. I, I guess it's that thing of like... <sighs> You're going to paint them anyway. Yeah. It's definitely a mindset thing. You're going to paint them anyway. The time's going to pass anyway. You might as well just throw, try and do them all at once. I will contradict myself in the sense of though, like I know from experience, I've done both. I've had varying levels of, of success with both because I don't think it's that granular that it's just foolproof every single time. But goes back to what I said earlier on the show was know your strengths and make that trade of time knowing where it's best spent because you might be quicker doing two squads of 25 than two squads of 50 because mm. if you're doing 50 and by the time you get to 48 you're like your mind's wandering you like can barely tolerate it mm. whereas if you've done like 25 one day 25 the next day you might be quicker i i, yeah. I think the happy medium is 30 because because for most games yeah as in like 40k even bolt action and stuff like that a platoon of infantry uh you know even for british in in bolt action a, se a section is eight men i think someone will correct me in the comments if i'm wrong but yeah i think if, you don't want to be getting bolt yeah. action stuff wrong yeah, mate they'll come for it's you. the wrong and crowd that, to piss uh, off yeah they're gonna come <laughs> for you what, what you I'll, think 40k crowds what, bad what I, what I would purely say is around about 30 is, is kind of like the, the sweet spot because it gives you the option of getting all three of your infantry units painted and done which is which when you think of most armies not maybe not knights and stuff like that but for most armies maybe it is a, is it, yeah it's a thing that you have to work towards almost yeah. like at first it's soul destroying but but once you once you break the back on it, you you'll never do it a different way. I don't have like a hard opinion on like a number because I think for me it would just depend on like the unit type, how motivated I'm feeling that week. Yeah, but it's you like know. you say, like uh, it's how if if you've if you had previously had experience in painting sixty infantry models at once and you've done it four times, then the fifth time is going to be easier, isn't it? I suppose so. But I guess most people who are listening to this aren't going to be, probably aren't going to be painting 60 lots of infantry four times. Yeah. But yeah, we, we get it from obviously dealing with a lot of the team and, and we know that certain people are more proficient at army jobs and certain people aren't and some people are faster, some people are slower. Like we see every variation of, of that really. I guess um, it depends how deep you want to go either because you could, <laughs> it depends how, how far into the future you're planning, right? If you're like, okay, and I'm going to be really, really slow at patch painting 30 models this time. But by my fifth army in 2032, yeah, yeah. I'm going to have done this so many times. I think times I was thinking at it more from a point of view of like, obviously the commission painters and yeah, because that's the painters that we have to deal with. Yeah. Yeah. Because they are going to have to paint armies and armies. Sorry, everyone, but you are going to have to paint <laughs> armies and armies and armies. Like, yeah. That's just how it works. But the thing is the tolerance thing, just to throw this on the end, like at first 10 will seem a lot, but then if mm. you do 20, 10 will feel like nothing. And if you do 30, 20 will feel like nothing. The more you can build up to, the the better you'll be because you'll be able to tolerate more. It is a it is a soul destroying at first, but once you've once you've nailed it, you you you'll you'll master it and not want to paint any other way. Ultimately, as well, one final thing for me on approaching painting an army. Um I can't remember if it was on this podcast or or something I'd done previously or uh, was that a tournament or something but I got told once that when you're picking an army to um, you're, it's tempting to gravitate towards like what characters you love mm -hmm. but what you should actually do 
is gravitate towards the infantry that you love because mm-hmm. they're the ones you're going to be painting a lot of. So rather than being like, oh, this character's so cool, oh, I want to paint the Silent King, oh, blah, blah, whatever, well, you better like Necron Warriors then because you're going to be painting <laughs> you paint 80 of them. Like, so pick the infantry that That's you like. That's a really good point. Yeah, pick the yeah. infantry that you like. Most of the characters in 40K are cool. Most of the character models are cool. Every army has cool character models. Pick the infantry that you actually love the look of. Yeah, okay. and everyone like you can throw like people love kit bashing and making custom stuff anyway. So yeah, you're gonna you're not you might yeah, we're talking about doing stuff. No, quicker. no, no. But you might be tempted to kit bash a character. But if you really, really love a character and you pick an army, but then you don't oh, like I the infantry, you're, yeah, yeah. you're not gonna want to kit bash like fifty infantry. Yeah, but so, you might pick an army where you love the infantry but you don't there's no characters that you're drawn to you, you can, can spend one. that time making a really really nice character that you're actually yeah. drawn to yeah i think that's i can't credit whoever told me that but so i remember hearing that and being like my mind is blown i've never even thought of that before yeah big news tickets are now on sale for the siege studios painting classes for 2024 for over eight years we've been running in-depth hands-on classes across the uk which has allowed us to create the perfect learning environment for improving your painting skills with a variety of topics available all our courses are taught by senior artists and feature practical demonstrations in a relaxed environment that welcomes interaction from you discussions on theory and an open q a session so you can ask that burning question you've had on your mind you can even bring your models for feedback to book now and reserve your place before tickets set out head over to siegestudios.co.uk forward slash shop I'll see you on a class soon. Question of the week time. Thank you everyone for submitting your questions for question of the week. If you have a question that you would like us to answer on the show, please leave it in the comments section on YouTube. Or if you're listening on an audio platform, please DM us on our Instagram page at Siege Studios. Uh, This week, our question comes from Johnny the King, who says, Hi guys, love the content. Would love to hear some tips on stripping models. And what's a good method of stripping models? Uh, Nice to know that there's royalty listening to us, which yeah. is nice. Um, I mean, we all probably have the same answer for stripping models, I think, don't we? Biostrip 20, 20 to 500 times every day of the week, 15 yeah. million Bio times. Biostrip 20. Yeah. And also, it's funny, even within the Biostrip 20 process, um, you've got some people that leave them in there for a day, some people that leave it in for half hour. I've personally often found I'll leave it in like the Biostrip for like half hour, something like that or 20 not hardly at any time just let it let it get a good soak oh, I'm talking plastic miniatures here yeah. as well um, and then I'll sort of brush it and and run it under you no know, water and get and I feel like and then put it back in because I feel like getting all the chip initial chips and things off yeah kind of weakens it enough so that then when when it's in Round there two. again yeah. it's like get, it's really getting in yeah. there yeah. Um, whereas if you just solid leave it in there for a day I feel like then you come to do it and it's all kind of congealed and like yeah. there's bits like in the crevices and stuff that you can't get to and you're in there with a toothpick I'll, or whatever I'll tell you this now metal your gold and you can leave it in there for the rest of your life yeah plastic I wouldn't leave it in there longer than 7 to 10 minutes max and take it out for the first thing I think you can de- you can definitely leave it in there. I've seen it melt. Safely. I've seen it melt plastic if you leave it in too long, like as in as in it, the plastic just gets really really soft. Yeah, like, it definitely cut, it yeah. has like a weird thing to it. Yeah, resin, I wouldn't leave it in longer than five minutes. I'd just get a nice good nice good covering, leave it. I'd rather do that three or four times. I suppose you want to creep up on it. Like you'd rather have to do it a few more it, times. It's kind of it's funny because it's kind of like the similar approach to like actually like base coating or something. Like you want to <laughs> yeah, do more. Coats. You want to do <laughs> yeah. more. Yeah, smaller yeah. amounts I think yeah. is well you can't undo it right yeah you can't if, if you've over stripped it and you've melted the model there's no going back yeah. but yeah. you can always add more bio don't forget yeah. don't pass. forget that if you're using like stripping model is one thing I've got to say you know, you know, it just this is this. what I'm going to say next is the reason why as a business we, we don't strip models because and I'm talking on commissions and stuff like that like if people send us models that are half painted and things like that the reason why we don't do it is because it's an abrasive process to remove that paint and obviously the longer that you leave the models, if they're not metal in the solution or in the liquid, what tends to happen is obviously the abrasion and the friction caused by using a toothbrush or whatever it is that you use to take the paint off will, will damage the, the detail on the model. So it's it's like it's something that, as we've said, I'd rather do it three, four, five times, repeat, 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 than just leave it in for ages, put a toothbrush to it, and then realize that you've basically scoured the model with brush marks because you've literally been, yeah. been sort of like scrubbing rough surface onto the model. 
Um, generally speaking, I don't think it's viable at scale anyway. No, I don't. Like, know. unless you've got some models that are super rare or for whatever reason, like there might be an external reason to strip them. Fair enough. But nine times out of 10, it's for like a character or something. I can see it like you're trying to save some money. You've got something you weren't happy about painted or a product, you know, messed up and didn't give you the results. Totally get it. But in terms of if I had like a whole army that I painted and I wanted to paint a new one, the risk factor is just way too the high risk for me. Is I don't the think risk, it's replicatable the enough. Risk. The risk of the bio strip potentially softening the plastic or the resin, resin definitely it will do it too. You've got the risk of damage through 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 just abrasion and using a toothbrush or using something like a brush to just make sure you disturb all the softened paint and ruined and, and removed um, and uh, reduced paint. You've got breakages as well. Like abrasion is a technique, is a process which especially which, if they're like spindly models, yeah, like just just that like, process, like, like forgetting the actual yeah. removal of paint, like just manhandling models like yeah. that. Is you know there's a lot of risk involved, which you know um, is is just something that an indi as an individual user level, of course, look, I've done it. My personal stuff, I've stripped stuff in the past. That's fine. I think on a more com sort of commercialized business side of things, we, that's why we we don't do it. But but what I would say is that like just just weigh up the time. Like, am I going to have to spend half an hour uh, stripping this model or an hour stripping this model, um, or could I stick it on eBay, sell it to somebody who doesn't really mind that too much? And then recoup the recoup the, the a bit of funds towards a replacement, and then the time investment to build it and clean it ready for spraying is actually less than the time. Well, we've spent spoken about it. prep like so many times, and how important it is to the finished look of the model. Like we had a whole episode on that, and I think that if you're stripping models, to me personally, in my experience, that model will probably not be a display piece. Like I it's just kind of missed its won't window. The, the canvas, yeah. As James always likes to call it. It won't be. Up to standard, yeah. Like just from game. the nature, you could strip it perfectly, but just the nature of that, I think. I yeah. think there's a bit of a combination. If the paint's really thin, then it's it's salvageable. But like if the paint's that, that thin, I'll find that I could just spray over it anyway. Potentially, yeah. Potentially, yeah. I would say, like on the stripping thing, like consider not stripping it. Yeah, because you might actually have a better job of just priming over it again. Say you've done like a you know thin. If, if you didn't have a load of texture on the model, and say it was one that you painted yourself, and you know how it was painted. You might have a better time just spray spraying over the model and starting again. You might have a bit of texture and imperfections, but trade up whether they're more or less than you would get if you stripped the model. Do you get yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, hobby hack. This is our closing weekly segment where we share a hobby hack with you. A little quick tip. Uh, James sort of uh, shared one with me earlier by accident. And uh, okay. I've made a note on this. So uh, we was pinning something earlier. And James, pinning, pinning something. Yeah, pinning something, putting it back together, yep. something that broke. And uh, just doing like a normal sub assembly of a pin. James was using paper clips and I sort of made fun of him. I was like, oh, why don't we get some like proper brass rod or whatever? Just sort of, uh, you know, having a riff. I, I use paper clips. To be yeah, fair. that's fine. I've, got, I've got, no, yeah. got no qualms with paper clips. He knows. Yeah. Got no problems with paper clips. I was just making a little, uh, it's a little joke. And then James pointed out something to me that I've never noticed before. So, you know how paper clips, the colored ones, They've got a, like sort of enamel coating on them, yeah, right? Like a rubberized plastic. Rubberized plastic. James, do you want to uh, do you want to tail off this? Well, uh, you can you can get some pliers or some of your really good clippers, and you just like like you would if you're cutting a wire, or if you're doing wiring in a house or electrical work, or whatever. You just cut, take off that enamel and just slide that off the off the thing. Mm -hmm. You cut that into little tubes. That's a uh, perfect uh, shell casings for your, uh, for your ah. basin. Very nice. Because they're hard plastic. They're perfect for, for using as shell casings if you cut them down to size. I suppose as well, if you didn't have any paper clips, you had a, for whatever reason, you had a bunch of like 24 AWG wire laying around, <laughs> yeah, you could probably yeah. do the same thing. But, uh, yeah. yeah. You probably so. don't want to encourage everyone to just go and do like wire stripping around the house to get some. No, we don't some... offer <laughs> electrical guidance on this podcast. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is not electronic advice. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's paint perspective yeah. as an uh, episode. Yeah. But yeah, that's can, pretty good. It's a good yeah. tip, though, isn't it? Because yeah. yeah. it's already like hollowed out as well. Yeah. It's not, you're not just dealing with like, you could do that with like a bit of brass wire, yeah. but it's not going to be hollowed. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, it works. Like really, it works really good. It's like a shell casing, which is quite cool. So, so yeah. Same was way. that said? Was it? Was James trying to justify his use of paper clips, and then he said that as like, a, oh, and you can do this with them. Yeah. Or was that? Yeah. 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 yeah perfect. Then I'd uh, never occurred to me. So yeah. And yeah. paper clips are a lot cheaper than put brass you rods. in your place. Then didn't yeah. it? Every day's a learning day. Try that with your brass rod. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank you everyone for listening to this week's episode of Paint Perspective uh, another little PSA plug for you little shameless plug uh, if you are listening to this podcast and you'd like to engage with other members of the community 
Uh, we do have the Siege Studios Discord server, which will be linked in the description. Uh, you can head over there. It's completely free. And we also have an area for patrons only uh, where you can chat to the Siege staff, myself being there, and you can ask us all sorts of questions, chat with the community, share hobby tips, that sort of thing. Uh, thank you very much for listening to this week's episode. We will catch you next time.